Welcome to a welcoming congregation. Welcome First Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We are a welcoming congregation, and I'll tell you more about what that means this morning. In the meantime, a very hearty welcome to our weekly service currently being streamed on Facebook. Past services are available to you on YouTube and on our website. I am the Reverend Annie Furster, minister at First Jefferson, and in spite of the pandemic and our current decision not to have in-person services, there's a lot going on here. Our Adult Religious Education and Exploration Committee has started a new program on Wednesday evenings you really don't want to miss. Next month is our semi-annual congregational meeting where we will be electing new board members for next year's Board of Trustees, creating a new lifetime membership for people who have been members for more than 20 years, and discussing the possibility of changing our name to better reflect our social, intellectual, and spiritual stances. This is in addition to upcoming holidays and all the programs you can already find online. If you are not on our mailing list where you can get links to all these events, just send an email to administrator at firstjefferson.org. And what would be more welcome right now than some inspiring music from our pianist, Misha Beresnev. Misha. Open the doors as far as they will go. Draw on the strength of the stones beneath you. Ground yourself in a firm sense of who you are. Stand as a beacon welcoming the next seeker and shine far beyond the lintel and sill. Open all that you are. Heighten and deepen your connections to the world around you. Broaden your definition of neighbor grow into the largest target for grace that you can muster and pray to become a gateway for even greater love and compassion. Open up the doors, my friends, lest we keep the stranger out and condemn ourselves to prisons of our own making. Our opening hymn this morning is number 86, Blessed Spirit of My, of my Life. Our hymn leader this morning is Reneal Baker.
you to say the chalice lighting words with me before I light the chalice. Our chalice stands for many of our beliefs and goals, a beacon of hope, the light of understanding, the warmth of love, the heat of our passion for justice and equity, and today I'm going to light the chalice first and then ask you to read with me some of the things that come out of the flame. Chalice is lit. Out of the flames of fear, we rise with courage of our deepest convictions to stand for justice, inclusion, and peace. Out of the flames of scrutiny, we rise to proclaim our faith with hope to heal a fractured and hurting world. Out of the flames of doubt, we rise to embrace the mystery, wonder, and awe of all there is and all that is yet to be. Out of the flames of hate, we rise with the force of love, love that celebrates our shared humanity. Out of the flames, we rise. Please join me in saying the covenant that we repeat every Sunday. Love is the doctrine of this church. And the quest of truth is our sacrament. Service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. Our service is about welcoming congregations, how they came to be, what they mean, and where they might take us. So much has come about in the last 35 years since their inception, I can only imagine with delight how much more is possible. So my questions for you today are these. What does it mean to be a welcoming congregation? What are my roles and obligations as a member or friend of such a group? And what next? But before we go into responses for those questions, let's listen to a story for all ages, the sad story of Scarlet and Bluebell, read by Thomas Earthman. Today's story is by our very own Reverend Annie Furster. Most stories begin long ago and far away, but not this one. This story begins recently and nearby. It's about Scarlet and Bluebell, identical twin girls born on the very first day of the 21st century, January 21st, 2001. They were so identical, a nurse at the hospital where they were born tied a red ribbon around the wrist of one of the babies and a blue ribbon around the wrist of the other baby, just so she could tell when they'd been fed and changed. That's how they got their names. Their parents saw the ribbons and named them Scarlet for the red ribbon and bluebell for the blue. As they grew, the ribbons wore out, but their parents continued to dress them in red and blue, both day clothes and nightgowns, so that no one would get them mixed up. 
when they were about six months old, their grandfather on their mother's side took them to a fortune teller that he knew to see what their futures would hold. Here's what they were told. Scarlet would be a famous writer. Her stories translated into 30 languages. Bluebell would be a famous mathematician, solving many of the problems even computers can't solve today. He would brought the twins home and told their parents he would pay for their education if they sent Scarlet to a school that was famous for producing great writers and Bluebell to a school for those intent on becoming mathematicians. Here's what they weren't told. Their babysitter, who was new and didn't know why they only wore red and blue, had helped to dress them that morning and put a blue romper over Scarlet and her red diaper and a red romper on Bluebell covering her blue diaper. So the predictions were backwards. It was Bluebell who was destined to become a writer and Scarlet who had become the great mathematician. But by the time they came home, the babysitter had learned about the clothes code and she quickly switched their outfits back without telling anyone. True to the prediction, Bluebell learned to read at a very early age. And as soon as she could write, she began making up stories. But her parents took away her stories and gave her a page full of numbers, showing her how to add and subtract them. Now, Scarlet learned to count at a very early age. And by the time she could write her numbers, she had discovered Sudoku. And then quickly, killer Sudoku, which was much harder to solve. But her parents told her to quit wasting time on number pursuits and go read a book. Both girls were pretty unhappy. As they grew older, they realized they were going to fail their most important classes if they didn't work together. So Bluebell helped Scarlet with her reading and taught her how to write essays when they got into college, when they got into high school. Scarlet helped Bluebell with her math problems and how to solve binomial distributions. They were both very smart and they managed to get passing grades in all their subjects through high school, but neither of them was very happy. So now they're in college and they're separated from one another but they keep in contact with phone calls and Zoom, and they still help each other with their homework. Scarlet tells Bluebell she wishes she could be herself and study the numbers she loves. And Bluebell tells Scarlet she wishes she could be herself and write the stories that fill her head. They cry a little together, and then they wish each other the strength to carry on. This would be a very sad story if it ended here today, but I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. Together, the twins will decide that sometime next year, they are going to stand up for themselves. They will go to an aptitude counselor and take tests to determine what they would do best with their lives. The test will reveal their true skills and their preferences, and their parents will apologize in dismay. The girls will transfer to each other's current schools and begin their studies all over. They'll still keep in touch with phone calls and Zoom, but they'll have a lot to smile about. They'll be happy with the skills they're learning and improving. Now, it's too soon to tell if either one will really become famous, but it's important that they both feel like they're being true to themselves. The hearts that beat under their red and blue dresses do not need color coding to know what love is all about. world when I started in the ministry in 1985 than it is today. I couldn't have predicted what wonderful changes might be made in my lifetime any more than I might have predicted how much hate and violence would accompany those changes or how much love. The Welcoming Congregation program started at about the same time as I got my first churches, but I didn't find out about it for a year or so. I was too busy being new adjusting to the joys and demands of ministry. Since Stonewall a decade or more before, we all knew about the trials and tribulations of gay people in America. Things weren't easy for them. 
but at least we were talking about them a little and wondering what we might do to help. Let me take that back. Some people were talking about these trials and tribulations, but not everybody. Not the people in my two yoked churches, small congregations outside of a larger metropolitan area. Caution was the byword. And as a new minister, I was not about to back into that buzzsaw without a little research. So for my part, I was in contact with gays and lesbians in the area, or I should say they were in touch with me. At the time, services of Holy Union were generally known to be offered by Unitarian Universalist ministers. This was a ceremony for same-sex couples that allowed them to make vows of commitment to one another until such time, way in the future, we could only hope, when marriage would be legal for them. Mostly, the couples I met had heard about our church from other couples they knew, and my willingness to perform such ceremonies for non-members. The services were often held in parks, in pavilions, in people's homes. None of them were members of my church because many gays and lesbians assumed that all churches rejected them as members. But after a year of this, I decided to come out of my own closet of secrecy and tell my congregation that I was performing these ceremonies. By then, I had discovered the fledgling program called Welcoming Congregation established by the Unitarian Universalist Association, and I encouraged the congregations to participate in it. I told them of the ceremonies I had performed and suggested that we make the church a welcome place to perform these ceremonies and invite this still beleaguered community to attend. Well, the results of this service were amazing. People in both congregations came to me later saying, it's about time we talked about this adding that they had a brother or a sister or a daughter or son who was gay or lesbian. And among the 250 so members of each congregation, only one man objected to me. He said he wasn't against them particularly, but he was against talking about it publicly. After all, he protested, it's embarrassing enough to admit you're a Unitarian. It turned out his friends had teased him about belonging to a disorganized religion. Later, he found new friends among other members of this church and became a staunch advocate of the welcoming congregation. And before long, we did have members who were out of the closet, openly gay, and working to make it easier for others. We were the headquarters for the county's gay, lesbian, and bisexual support network. I spoke several times a year on related topics, and after it was published in 1989, read Heather Has Two Mommies, to the children at least once a year. In those days, it was daring to be that kind of church, and we received threats and criticism regularly. The Welcoming Congregation program helped us through those heady and frightening days. I became a spokesperson on the topic for the local ministers group made up of ministers whose denominations forbid them to talk on the subject in public or offer services of Holy Union. The program itself was educational, formational, and supportive. It told of the history of secretness and hatred of those who knew next to nothing about it. It made suggestions how to be welcoming and how to talk to other people about this topic. And throughout the years, the program has expanded from supporting lesbians and gays to include bisexual, transgenders, questioning, and queer. Because there had been so much silence for so many years, one of the most important lessons was how to talk about the issues. First and foremost, it was not an issue of them and us. It was an issue for all people. It was to understand that gender, which is about identity, or, and orientation, which is about how you relate to others sexually, and choice, which is about how you feel compelled to express yourself, and roles, which are expectations from other people, are all different aspects of being human and have many variations. I remember being in a meeting in which a Native American speaker said he had been taught as a child that there are seven genders, not just two. There are women who love men, women who love women, women who love both, men who love women, men who love 
um, men and men who love both and people who do not relate sexually at all. It became much clearer to me how we were to talk to one an about and to one another. It turns out it was even more complicated than that. But let's leave that for a minute and we'll come back to it later. Right now I'd like to offer my generosity report. We suggest that as a commitment to the church and denomination after joining, members might offer their time doing volunteer work, their talent, sharing what they know and do best, perhaps teaching others, and, and their treasures, an annual pledge to support the church budget. I'm so pleased today to announce the names of four people who are pledging their time and talents for the next two years by serving on the board of directors. At our congregational meeting next month, those members standing for the board for the first time will be Roy Brake as treasurer, Rosalind Hunter and Christine Laquise as members at large, and Brian Skinner for president after serving one year as a member at large. Thank you all for your generosity. Now going off the board in January, our current president, David Winkowski, current treasurer, Dan Sexton, and member at large, Joe Burnham. And we are grateful to them for their many years of service on the board of trustees. I'm also grateful for the many members and staff who have already voted in the upcoming election, presidential election, and for senators and, and all that's this year. I plan to vote next Monday. Actually, I wrote this yesterday, and then I went and voted yesterday, so I'm not going to vote next Monday. I have already voted uh, with early uh, voting that started in Texas. I encourage everyone to take advantage of early voting or voting by mail to get counted in this important election. And I am grateful to say, to say thank you when you do. I do not have a reading in the usual sense of the word, but I think what I'm about to share will be helpful to you. When I started in this work, the alphabet soup designation for this community of closeted and formerly closeted people was LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Listen, the designation is now LGBTQIA+. And even I get confused sometimes when trying to talk about a group of people as different from one another as they can be. In addition to the new letters, there are also new words, or words I have never used until now. If you don't want to embarrass yourself, pay attention, because how you talk to one another is important. Okay, here goes. LGBTQIA plus is a common abbreviation for lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, transgender, genderqueer, queer, intersexed, agender, asexual, and ally community. Don't panic, I'm going to take them one at a time. Queer has become an umbrella term which embraces a matrix of sexual preferences, orientation, and habits of the not exclusively heterosexual and monogamous majority. Gender queer, sometimes called non-binary, is a spectrum of gender identities that are not exclusively masculine or feminine, identities that are outside the gender binary. Non-binary identities can fall under the transgender umbrella since many non-binary people identify with a gender that is different from their assigned sex. And just for your edification, the antonym of gender queer is cisgender, denoting a, or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with their birth sex, which is related to their external sexual organs. You have to understand that science has shown us this is not the only nor the most ideal way to identify gender. Intersex people are individuals born with any of several variations in sex characteristics, including chromosomes, gonads, sex hormones, or genitals that, according to the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, quote, 
do not fit the typical definitions for male or female bodies, unquote. This range of atypical variation may be physically obvious from birth. Babies may have ambiguous reproductive organs, or at the other extreme range, they are not obvious and may remain unknown to people all their lives. The word agender denotes a person who does not identify themselves as having a particular gender. One of the common mistakes is the presumption that an agender person must also be asexual. Not true. A person who is asexual is one who has no sexual feelings or desires or who is not sexually attracted to anyone. Now, pansexuality, on the other hand, is sexual, romantic, or emotional attraction toward people regardless of their sex or gender identity. Pansexual people may refer to themselves as gender blind, asserting that gender and sex are not determining factors in their romantic or sexual attraction to others. And finally, the ally community are those people who support the LGBTQIA community. This might seem unnecessarily complicated, but consider all the people for whom these designations are so important, who have been locked in their closets for so many centuries. Well, do you think I left anything out? Oh, yeah, heterosexual refers to men and women who are attracted to and interact with the opposite sex gender. We are more interesting species than we ever imagined. Please join me now in singing our hymn number 1053 in the Teal Hymnal, How Could Anyone? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you are connected to my soul. Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church did go through the program of education required by the welcoming congregation, and it achieved the official status. There are 11 recommendations for personal commitment that go with the program, two suggestions for action, four for education, 10 for community life, and six more for community outreach. They are not compulsory, but most congregations that go through the program realize their wisdom and adopt them. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to subject you to a reading of all 33 steps, but I will tell you how the program has worked here at First Jefferson. We proclaim our support even before you walk in the door. Banners on the side of the building, signs in the window, and plaques on the bathroom doors state our commitment to the welcoming congregation program. 
we use or attempt to use inclusive language without making assumptions of anyone's sexual or gender identity. That's why I thought it important to share with you the definitions you might not have understood and want to reflect in your own conversation. Inclusivity in both our children's and adults' religious education and exploration programs and our sex education program, Our Whole Lives, includes explanations about gender and sexual identity. We welcome same-gender same families and non-conventional families, as well as individuals, individuals who are seeking their identities and are not yet sure or committed. Annually, we have attended the Fort Worth and Dallas Gay Pride Parades, carrying banners that identify our church and our support. We do outreach as well as education, advertising our presence and commitments in local gay publications, and we have at least three organizations that rent space in our building that support families of LGBTQs, LGBTQ teens, and the education of uh, what is sometimes referred to as the straight community. We are committed to supporting legislation that favors this diverse community and eliminating laws that are unfair to it. I'll have more to add to that in a minute, but let's now take time to consider the people who are in this community and have stories they would like to share. I don't know how many other people have stories that they haven't shared with us, but they are out there and we know them personally and we keep them in our hearts and our minds even though we don't know what's going on with them. So let us take a moment to share the silence and meditation as we consider this living community that is separated now by the pandemic, but still belongs to us and to each other. Let us be in silence. Misha, can you support our silence with some music? As Misha was playing, I opened my eyes and I looked up at the window near the ceiling. I could see the tops of some trees swaying in the breeze and it looked almost as if they were dancing in time to the music. And it makes me think how connected we really are even when we're apart. So what next? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I'm open to learning and to following I think the learning aspect is important for everyone, staying open and following the latest setbacks and steps forward. Fortunately, I have many good teachers in this congregation and within this faith community. 
It is no secret that I am a word person and much of my own work has been to help people talk about their personal situations, to talk to one another and to express their deepest feelings. How we use language is very, very important as we have learned in other social justice situations. How we refer to people, how we talk about them, how we talk to them is important. It can be supportive or it can be horribly devastating. We have had to unlearn language we didn't even realize was offensive because it was unfortunately the everyday language of our childhood. I remember once remarking that the children who participated in the service that day were unusually excitable that morning. They behaved like a pack of wild Indians, I said, without considering the words themselves, but using the language my parents had used when my siblings and I were disorderly. My religious education director said simply and kindly, not all Native Americans were people who were warlike. Ah, I never used that phrase again except as an example of things not to say because they are assumptions, not reality. Today, people are encouraged to declare what pronouns they want to be known by. And it can be confusing to people who don't understand the importance of personal identity, especially around issues of gender and sexual identity. The fact that some people who consider themselves non-binary or genderqueer want to be referred to as they or them is confusing to many cisgender people. We must just assume that they are as confused when they are felt to be slotted into categories that don't suit them. It takes some getting used to, and people who support the queer community often list their pronouns without being asked, even if they are considered to be what is expected. My pronouns are she and her. But I think the most important attitude to what is happening, what is coming, and what is next on the step toward being truly welcoming is to avoid assumptions. Avoid making assumptions about the sexual orientation or gender identity of any of our members, visitors, or children. And be open to challenges to assumptions that you do make. Take time to ask, and then always respect each person's identity, self-labels, and pronoun preferences. A world lived openly, with compassion, acceptance, and love is a much more interesting world than the one presented to me when I was a child. All lives are made up of the experiences one garners in their ethnic communities, their educational communities, their sexual communities, their ableism, their life experiences, and their dreams and hopes for the future. Like snowflakes, no two people are alike. No one need ever be bored. All you have to do is tell people your name, smile, and ask, and what is your story? Birds of a feather may flock together, but it's because they don't feel safe any other way. If we make the world safe for everyone, oh, what a glorious time will be the span of our lives. Everything will be possible. And that's our closing hymn for today, number 1019 in the Teal Hymnal, Everything Possible. Oh!
some race on ahead, some follow behind, some go in their own way in time. Some women love women, some men love men, some raise children, some never do. You can dream. That was beautiful. We lit this chalice to help us find inner peace. Love for each other and faith in ourselves. We have extended it as a symbol of welcome to whoever we meet. We can put it out now because we take it in our hearts and our minds. It lives within us all. So now, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. And honor all beings. So may it be in all our lives. <laughs>